I'm Marcy McDonald, the online course doctor, here to help you improve your online courses by unpacking what works, what doesn't work, and what you can do to make them better. Today, we continue our interview series with Dr. Stephen Ressler, who I consider to be the absolute master of using demonstrations to teach well and to get people hooked on his content. Now, Steve is Professor Emeritus from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Before he retired in 2013, he was professor and head of the USMA Department of Civil and Mechanical Engineering. He also served for 34 years as a commissioned officer in the US Army Corps of, Engineer, of Engineers, working on assignments around the world. He retired at the rank of Brigadier General. Steve's passion is engineering education. Over the past seven years, he's produced four engineering lecture series for the great courses, also known as the teaching company. Now you might be asking yourself, do that many people really want to know about engineering? Well, the answer is yes, if you teach it the way Steve does. He's achieved some of the highest customer satisfaction ratings in the company's 25 year history, not to mention some of the highest grossing sales and getting a whole lot of people who didn't care one whit about engineering to become total mad enthusiasts who buy every course Steve creates just because they're so dynamic and engaging. In fact, Steve now teaches on cruises and around the world because he's got such a large and loyal fan base. They'll follow him anywhere. Hey, Steve, thanks so much for joining me today. Hi, Marcy. Uh, great to, to be here. It's a, it's a joy to have this opportunity to talk to you and to your audience as well. That's wonderful. So, Steve, we're going to jump right in there. What would you say are the top three to five things online course creators need to think about or to do when they're doing demonstrations? Well, I, I, first of all, I can't help myself. So I'm going to give you six things to think about rather than just three to five. And I hope you'll indulge me in going one over my limit. Um, let's call them six principles for the use of demos in online courses. Um, principle number one, never do a demo solely for the purpose of just doing a demo. There should always be a clear, unequivocal, educational ob objective underlying the use of the demonstration. So what might be a legitimate educational objective for the use of, of demonstrations? I find in my own experience, there are three times, three situations or circumstances during which demonstrations make sense for me to integrate into my classes. Um, and those three things are first, to show some sort of a physical object or physical system works or operates. Uh, second, how that physical system might be constructed or assembled. And third, simply how that physical object looks, how it appears. Um, now, talking through those things in reverse order, uh, starting with that third purpose to illustrate how something looks, it's a viable application for a demonstration, but perhaps not the most powerful one. Uh, in many cases, showing how something looks can be done just as easily with a good high resolution photo or with some sort of a diagram or graphic or perhaps a 3D computer model. Um, so that may not always be the most powerful use of a demonstration on unless uh, the object in question lends itself well to that purpose. In the, in the second uh, of, of my three circumstances, that is using the demonstration to show how something is assembled or, or constructed, in many instances, this is a very powerful use of a demo, particularly if the object in question is, is in, of reasonable size um, and the process of physically assembling it on camera for your audience uh, lends to their understanding of that, of that object. Um, however, I often find, particularly when I'm teaching about architectural or engineering subjects, the object in question is really too complicated to assemble as a demo. So in those circumstances, I would prefer to use a three-dimensional computer model in lieu of the demo in order to make the, the necessary points. But my first reason for using demos is the one which uh, I highly recommend as the absolute preferred alternative where the demo is almost always the best alternative. And that is how some sort of a physical object or system works, how it operates in, in, the, in the physical world. Um, so for example, I, I, I'm a structural engineer. I teach courses on structural engineering. And, and structural engineering objects or systems always involve a lot of the use of beams. You know, a beam is a structural element that, that carries load by bending. 
And so when I want to talk about how a beam works, the physical demonstration does a far better job than anything else in demonstrating what that physical behavior of flexure or the bending of a structural element actually looks like. You know, when I bend this object, you can physically see the object bend. You can see how those straight lines, the black vertical straight lines, change in their orientation when the bending occurs. They get closer together on the top. They get farther away on the bottom. The red line in the center represents something called the neutral axis, uh, where no, no uh, elongation or shortening occurs. And so I could, I could do it a whole lot to demonstrate, to explain how the, the, the structural behavior associated with bending beams operates by use of the demo in a way that wouldn't work with a, say, a three-dimensional computer model-based simulation, because the simulation is just that. It's, it's a simulation. It's artificial. And so um, the physical demo is much more convincing. Audiences are much more likely to believe what they're seeing because the model operates under the same set of laws of physics as, as, as the, the real system out in the world does. And so the analogy between the, the demonstration and the real world is more authentic. It's more believable. So that's how the physical demonstration really earns money for you when you're trying to teach a, a complex compl uh, concept that involves the physical behavior of some sort of an object or system. So, so that's a very extended uh, discussion of my first principle. The other ones will go much more quickly. Second principle is, um, if possible, the demo should derive from the lecture, not the other way around. So when I plan the use of a demonstration, I almost always try to write out my lecture script first because I wanna tell the story and I want the story to drive the teaching point that I'm trying to make. As I'm writing the lecture script, I'm thinking about how a demonstration will enhance the point. But the key principle is to tell the story in the most compelling way before you have actually worked the demo into the script and then adapt the demo to the pedagogical purpose. So now I've written my script. I know what it is very precisely that I want the demo to do for me as part of telling that story. And now I head to the workshop where I will design and build the demo precisely in the way that best suits the educational objective that I'm trying to achieve. Now, obviously using this technique requires you to be the designer and the builder of your demos, or at least to be able to work in very close coordination with the person who's designing and building your demos. But to me, that's absolutely vital to creating demonstrations that integrate seamlessly with the lecture, that integrate seamlessly with the educational story that you're trying to tell. That's principle number two. Principle number three, clearly, obviously, anytime you do a demonstration, you need to very carefully plan how it's going to play out. Uh, don't just pick up the object and manipulate it. Uh, you need to set the stage. You need to orient the audience toward the, the picture that they're going to see as you manipulate the demo. So, you know, if I want to demonstrate how a roof truss works, I'm not going to start out by picking it up and, and placing it under load. I'm going to start by explaining what you're looking at. You know, it's not immediately obvious that this is a physical representation of a much more complicated structure that happens to be holding up the roof of your house. So I need to orient you to what this is so that you can, you can see the analogy between the small physical simplified idealization of a much more complicated physical system before we do the manipulation. Next, um, if, if, I'm, if I, I want to set up the manipulation, I want to clue you into what you're going to see so that you know to, where to look when the action actually occurs. So yeah, I'm going to clue you into the fact that this truss has uh, a couple of heavy diagonal members, which are going to carry loading compression, and it has a string connecting the bottoms of the diagonal members, which is going to carry load in tension. Um, so that now when I actually manipulate the model, when I place it under load, uh, you can focus your attention on that string and you can see that under load, the string snaps taut and the string is carrying load by stretching in tension. But while I'm doing that, I'm not going to talk. You know, I will set up the audience by telling them what the object is, establishing the analogy to the physical world, and then cluing them into what they're likely to see during the manipulation. But in the manipulation itself, I want to be silent. Uh, in part because um, whoever is doing your filming may want to go back and take some tight shots of some specific aspect of it. And because at this point in the demonstration, my voice is going to be a distraction. So, so I want to tell you what you're going to see, then show it to you, 
and then after the fact, explain what just happened. So you can go back and, 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 and reflect on it. And then once again, the producer of the course can go back and show an instant replay, perhaps show that tight shot um, that, that was being captured uh, while the demonstration was underway. Uh, and uh, while my voiceover is describing what you just saw. Uh, so again, that the sequence of events is very important, and it's important, very important to, to not only set up the demo verbally, but then train yourself to be quiet when you're actually doing the demo so that the audience can focus on the action. Um, okay, and that, so that's my, my third principle. And now, luckily, we can wrap up quickly because principles four, five, and six are all the same. Practice, practice, practice. Um, no matter how well designed a demo is, no matter how well integrated it is into your, uh, your plan of instruction, you're going to fall on your face if you haven't attempted to, uh, to, to, to work through that process multiple times until it feels natural, until you know exactly what to expect is going to happen when you do the manipulation of the demonstration, and you know the words to say to amplify that. Uh, so practice, practice, practice. Uh, it's the only way to get to Carnegie Hall, and it's the only way to do a good demo. Steve, that was fantastic. Both the principles, thank you for sharing those, and also your unpacking of the principles so that we understand them better. Some of that I'd never heard put quite that way, so that was beautiful. But speaking of the need to practice, practice, practice so that things don't go awry, has there ever been a time when doing a demonstration despite practice on video went completely out of whack and how did you rescue the situation? <laughs> oh, has there ever been? I could tell you stories for the rest of the day about the great demo disasters that I've, uh, that I've had to work through uh, primarily in the, in the lectures that I do for the great courses. Um, I think probably the best story, the one that's most illustrative of the fact that no matter how well prepared you are, uh, no matter how much you practice, things are still bound to go awry and you need to be prepared for those sorts of, of, of occurrences. Uh, I think the best story is, is the, what has come to be known as the great bow and arrow disaster of 2013. Um, so I was teaching a course for the great courses uh, on uh, uh, understanding Greek and Roman technology. So the course is about the engineering and technology of the ancient world. Um, this particular lecture was about the subject of catapults. Uh, and I was um, walking the audience through the process of understanding how the catapult was developed as a natural evolution of uh, the earlier development of the bow and arrow. And in fact, that that um, ancient Greek and Roman catapults really were direct response to the human limitations associated with the, the, the traditional bow and arrow. Um, so as part of this early discussion, I had my bow and arrow uh, and I did a demonstration of the operation of the bow and arrow. And that sounds pretty simple. This was actually very complicated because the, um, the visual effect that we decided on using in conjunction with the demonstration was that I would draw the bow, the bow and I had an arrow uh, notched into the, into the bowstring as well. I would draw the bow and in real time, as I was drawing the bow, there would also be an inset graph in the upper corner of the picture. And that graph would be generating a plot of drawing force versus drawing length as a way to illustrate uh, how elastic energy is stored in a, in a bow uh, during a bow shot. So it's very complicated because we had to do the draw in stages uh, in order to, to, to draw attention to the fact that the graph was being generated directly in conjunction with uh, my manipulation of the bow. So I, so I held the bow up, uh, placed the arrow into the bowstring, and then drew just a short distance and then explained what was going on. And then I had to increase the, the length of the draw and then do some more explanation of what was going on and then increase the length of the draw even further and add some more in, uh, explanation. And then finally, as the climactic final event, release the bowstring and shoot the arrow. Now the shooting the arrow really wasn't a major aspect of the demonstration. It was just the final dramatic event uh, to bring closure to the notion that the bow takes all of this elastic energy that's stored in the bent bow and translates into kinetic energy in the flying projectile. So all that really had to happen was the arrow had to fly out of the frame off, off, uh, off set. 
Uh, aiming never even entered my mind because I was so distracted by all these other things. And, and, and I really had convinced myself that the target was so big and so close that I couldn't possibly miss. Well, I, I, it wasn't even close. And I actually hit the camera. Luckily, I didn't hit the lens. The, 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 the arrow missed the lens by perhaps a half an inch and lodged in a handle on the top of the lens. I was so astonished by the fact that the arrow had flown so wide of the target that my face registered instantaneously a very authentic look of horror. And, and there's no doubt that it was authentic because I was horrified by what had just happened. And at the end, in the heat of the, of the moment, I had no idea whether I had done any damage to the camera or not. So, so if, you, if you look at the video of this lecture, you'll see my eyebrows raise up and my eyes get really large for just an instant. And then of course I was trained well by the great staff at the great courses uh, to not let anything phase me. And so after this momentary uh, uh, shock of having missed the target, um, I um, took a deep breath, uh, turned back toward the camera and resumed the lecture, uh, expecting full well that we would have to redo the shot because of my reaction to it. Uh, well, fortunately, I had a great producer, James Blanford, um, who has been the producer on all of my Great Courses lecture series. He's a very creative guy, and he quickly figured out that there was a way around the problem. And so in post-production, at the instant the arrow flies out of the frame and my face registers this instantaneous look of horror, he dubbed in this very vaguely, uh, just barely audible sound of a voice saying, ouch. And, uh, and so for all intents and purposes, it appeared that I just shot a person off stage and suddenly the look of horror on my face made perfect sense. Uh, so there, it, by, by just injecting this tiny little bit of humor, uh, at the critical moment at the end of the demo, he saved the shot and we ended up with what turned out to be a real highlight of the course. Uh, and, and then the PS, the postscript to the story is, at that moment, James recognized that because that was one of several demo disasters that had occurred during the course, and they had all of them on film, that, that uh, this presented another opportunity for creative uh, expression. And, and James, at that moment, originated the idea of putting an outtakes reel at the end of the lecture series that uh, compiled together all of the demo disasters into one, and he sent them to music. And it, it turned out to be one of the most popular aspects of this course was watching the outtakes with all of these failed demos at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the lecture series. Um, so I suppose this, this really comes, brings to mind two new principles uh, of the use of demos in online education. Uh, one of those being, don't be afraid to take a risk. You know, things go wrong. It's inevitable that things are gonna go wrong in the conduct of demos. Accept that, roll with the punches, and in many cases, even the failed demos have great potential for entertainment value. And then the other principle, of course, is, always have an outtakes reel. And then, then you have something to do with all the failed fail demos after, after you're done with the course. And two great additional principles. And I'm glad you didn't actually shoot the cameraman or the lens, but uh, great save by James Blanford. Also, James's save for that mishap and the other mishaps brings to mind that you've been an academic professor for years, but you're very entertaining, engaging, and successful teaching online. So what do you do differently online? You know, what are the things that have been hard to adjust to, but what are the things you like better, perhaps, about teaching online rather than in person? Friends, be sure to check below the video for a link to Steve's course, do-it-yourself engineering, and of course, check out all his other courses and get them all. They're wonderful. So don't forget to sign up for weekly insightful guidance and tips from me, yours truly, your online course doctor. I'll see you next time.